Good morning. I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, as, as Vino said, I've, I've been here a while. Uh, I was here at the beginning of the heart surgery program, and we've been doing heart surgery here since 1988, back when there was only one hospital. So I've seen a lot of change. Okay. So uh, I had a little chuckle this morning. You know, I think one would, would tend to think that maybe surgery is dead as, in regards to aortic valve surgery, but it's, it's not. Steve Sigmund told me, he says, hey, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing your talk today. I know it's going to be a short one. <laughs> <laughs> so I can hear it, Steve saying that, the actually. Only, <laughs> the only reason it's going to be short is because we've covered a lot of this already, but I'm, I'm going to try to... Uh, tell you about it from my viewpoint. Now, I, I think the most important question or, or the, the primary question that we have when we see somebody with aortic valve disease is, is to ask if, if they're going to be a candidate for a mechanical prosthesis. It's, it's not, uh, uh, you know, we always say bioprosthesis or mechanical, but if, if they are mechanical valve candidate, then, then they're going to need surgery for that. So I, the, the controversy comes into what if they are not a mechanical valve uh, candidate, or what if we can't do a Ross procedure on them or a valve sparing operation. So we'll, we'll focus more on the patients who are not mechanical valve candidates throughout this. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting, you know, looking at the guidelines for mechanical valves, it, it, it was interesting to me that they said that uh, it, it's reasonable to consider a mechanical valve for someone less than 50, and it's reasonable to individualize uh, mechanical valves in patients between 50 and 70 years a, of age. And those age breakoffs have changed a bit. And you see on this part here in, in the 2020 guidelines, uh, the less than 50 mechanical valve, 50, 65 mechanical or bioprosthesis, and then greater than 65 for bioprosthesis. These are the numbers for Piedmont Atlanta. Uh, the, the curve that, that's uh, the orange curve is uh, our TAVRs, yeah, where we, we approached uh, almost 500 TAVRs in 2022. So you see very good growth in the TAVR in our TAVR patients. The line that's right below that is the combined surgery and uh, an isolated aortic valve. So that has been pretty flat. So it, you know, it doesn't look like our business is going away. It's, uh, it's stayed pretty flat. It's just more concomitant procedures. Yeah, concomitant and, and isolated there. The, the red is, a, is the isolated uh, surgical AVRs, and, and you do see a decline in that. I feel like we're seeing more root surgery, though, I'll tell you. I mean, I, I think that's becoming more, because it's these bicuspids with big roots and stuff. I think we're seeing more of that. I wonder if that this data includes the root replacements in addition to just SAVRs. Right, it does. It, 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 it includes anything, valve coronaries, uh, ascending valves. Yeah, uh, that's that growth, I think. root replacements. So, you know, what, what do we need to make a, an informed decision? We, we rely on many different things, surgeon's experience, uh, the valvular anatomy, risk of the patient, what does the family want to do, what does the patient want to do? So there's, there's many issues that go into this, and we do have guidelines that help us with this. And, and you know, just to summarize this, this complicated uh, algorithm, you know, we all know that TAVR is preferred in, in high risk and prohibitive risk patients. And, and then it gets a bit, uh, a little bit gray after that. Uh, you know, generally we would say at low risk patients, we should uh, do surgery. But that being said, we, you saw on Vino's slides, a third of his patients were low risk patients. And, you know, so basically again, it, it still kind of, it kind of rotates around, is the patient a candidate for a mechanical valve? Are they a candidate for a pulmonary autograft? Is, is it something we could do a valve sparing root replacement on? And uh, th those are the patients that are gonna have surgery. Now there are anatomical risks that, to consider and, and, you know, Jim's went through a lot of these uh, as did Prashant Patients with severe concomitant coronary disease are more likely uh, they should have surgery. 
uh, multi-valve operations. Uh, say you have a patient who could have a mitral repair and an aortic valve replacement, tricuspid repair, you could take care of that with surgery uh, as opposed to trying to do piecemeal transcatheter procedures on them. Some patients with prior open heart surgery, uh, there may be some issues like paravalvular leak where a transcatheter valve wouldn't help. And then other anatomical issues, and, and we see this the most, is, is patients who have excessive valvular calcium, particularly in the bicuspid aortic valve patients who were concerned about subannular calcium, calcium causing some issues, concerned about small sinuses of valsalva when we inflate the valve, uh, causing coronary occlusion, or even worse, annular rupture. And, you know, the, there, there are basic differences in TAVR, but the, the advantages of either, I think, the, I think that gap is closing. It, it used to be that there was a higher, higher pacemaker rate with TAVR, and, and that's, that's come down nicely and closely approximates the, the risk of needing a pacemaker after aortic valve surgery. And paravalvular leak, that's, that's improved considerably in TAVR. It's, I think we can operate on a patient with almost a zero risk of paravalvular leak. So I, I think that's, that's the ultimate goal for, for TAVR is to have almost a zero risk of paravalvular leak. So, you know, the, the question I was asked, is there still, an, is, is there, is, are there patients who are still candidates for surgery? And this is, this is my experience. The, it, it always boils down to patient preference. Some patients, quite honestly, want to have surgery as opposed to uh, TAVR. You know, you explain, them, explain to them all the risk of both, and, and even though TAVR is very safe, surgery is very safe, some patients are going to pick surgery. Patients who have active endocarditis should have surgery. Younger patients, particularly ones who wish to have a mechanical valve, a pulmonary autograft, or Machines. some bicuspid valves where a valve sparing operation you could uh, leave them with their valve and a good long-term result should have surgery. Patients who have other concomitant disease like multi multivalvular pathology and three vessel or sig significant coronary artery disease. And, you know, in Jim's slide, he said 4.5, and that, that really is the cutoff. But if, if your aorta is 5.0, you absolutely should have surgery. No questions, unless, unless you're an extreme risk patient or a high risk patient. And, and I think the other one we see here, that, uh, probably the most, is difficult anatomy. Patients who've had prior TAVR, prior surgery, uh, where there's going to be a high risk of coronary occlusion because of small sinuses of Alsalva or the patients who have calcium going infraannular uh, who on inflation you you think they'd be a high risk of having annular rupture or, or in cases where the annulus is too small or, or too big and you know, some patients who have you know, severe peripheral vascular disease, most of them are going to be higher extreme risk, but if, if they aren't, then they, they would be better treated with surgery and, and of course, active endocarditis. It, we, we, have operate, we have put TAVRs in patients who had endocarditis, but we, we usually treated them and made sure their cultures were negative and, and then did the TAVR. And in, in several instances, this was just a temporizing uh, circumstance where we got them better hemodynamically and ultimate, ultimately operated on them. But uh, so I, you know, I, I do think there is, is room for surgery in the future on these patients. The, the, my main observation is though that in, in people who are being trained now, new surgeons, they're not going to see the isolated aortic valve replacements that we saw. You know, there was a time when Early TAVR days, pre-TAVR days, we might uh, we might do four or five isolated aortic valve uh, op, uh, replacements per week, but uh, we we see less of that, but more of the complex, more difficult surgery. And you know, I, I think taking out a core valve is probably the most 
challenging operation that we see uh, in patients who've had TAVR because of the involvement with the aorta and manipulating these TAVR valves trying to get them out. So it's, it's going to take a, a surgeon who, who dedicates himself or herself uh, to taking care of these very sick patients. So, you know, the way we the way we accomplish this, it's important to approach this from a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, good imaging is very important, and, and we are fortunate in that we do have good imaging. Keep up with the guidelines, keep up with the literature, and it's important to not forget about the patient. Don't forget about their families. Let them make some of their healthcare decisions. Great.